Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, today I'm going to present a novel optical architecture uh, that supports uh, uh, widespread high bandwidth traffic in data center networks. And this is a joint work from both academia and industry and from both uh, Hong Kong and the US. The port count of uh, data center fabric is growing quickly with multiple layers of electrical switching added on top. And it has become quite costly to scale further. There has been continuous efforts in using optical networking data center networks uh, because of its low cost, uh, low power consumption at high link speeds, and low wiring complexity. In the meantime, the data center traffic demand is also growing rapidly. Uh, as reported by Google, uh, there has been 50 times growth in the data center traffic demand in the past six years. So the question for uh, how to design an optical data center fabric is that how do we design a fabric that enables high bisection bandwidth? At first glance, this, uh, this challenge may seem trivial, as the optical network are uh, known to provide high bandwidth one-to-one -one links. But another characteristic of data center traffic is that it is widespread. Uh, we can see from this trace from uh, the Microsoft data center network, the y-axis are the source racks, and the x-axis are the destination racks. And uh, the dots indicate the frequency of the communication between the source and destination pair. We can see that uh, each source can send to multiple other racks, and each destination can also receive multi from multiple other racks. And uh, this, this is also true in other data centers, for example, Facebook and Tencent. And we have described the traces of their data center traffic uh, in our paper. This poses a challenge for the uh, data center optical fabric. That is, how do we support both high bandwidth and widespread traffic? Previous works in optical networking in data centers have been trying to reuse the optical circuits in a time dimension uh, to satisfy the widespread uh, traffic demands. Uh, let's see a toy example of how it works. Uh, let's say we have a traffic uh, demand matrix like this, and it can be decomposed into multiple permutation matrices that can be uh, satisfied with arrangement of one-to-one -one circuits, one-to-one -one optical circuits. We can see that by reusing the circuits temporally, the traffic demand matrix can be satisfied over a longer time period. So using prior works, if a source wants to talk to multiple racks, uh, multiple destinations, it will need to wait for multiple uh, scheduling rounds uh, for, to complete this one-to-many communication. In contrast to the previous works, we, we approach this problem of providing high bandwidth and widespread connectivity in a spatial dimension. And instead of reusing the circuits temporally, we design Megaswitch, which uh, satisfy a widespread demand simultaneously by reusing the uh, wavelengths in a spatial domain. Uh, Megaswitch provisions multiple parallel circuits on different fibers using different wavelengths so that every uh, widespread traffic demand can be satisfied at the same time. So we will start to explain how Megaswitch works, uh, but we'll uh, start with the data plane design. And we will explain how do we enable the spatial reuse of wavelengths and our prototype implementation. We first describe the optical components uh, used in Megaswitch. Uh, the first one is the multiplexer, which takes K input wavelengths and output a fiber that contains these uh, K wavelengths. The opposite of um, the multiplexer is the demultiplexer, which will take one input fiber of K wavelengths and output these K wavelengths to its output ports. The most important uh, component of Megaswitch is the wavelength selective switch, WSS. Uh, WSS uh, takes W input fibers and selects the wavelengths from these fibers and output a fiber containing those selected wavelengths. In this example, uh, selecting from all four input, uh, input fibers will uh, enable a four-to-one communication. Uh, WSS can select uh, any non-interfering subset from the input uh, wavelengths, input fibers. Uh, for example, it can take three wavelengths from fiber one and one wavelength from fiber three, and this enables a two-to-one communication. So knowing how the optical components work, uh, we start from the sending aspect of Megaswitch. Uh, each electrical packet switch, the EPS, has K transceivers. And uh, these transceivers each have a different wavelength to send. And in this case, we have four transceivers. 
the wavelengths are multiplexed onto a single fiber in the optical wavelength switch, OWS, and amplify with one stage of optical amplifier. The fiber from node one will travel to all the other nodes uh, uh, using the passive routing fabric, uh, the PRF. In each node, the signal from node one is split down to the WSS and then demultiplex to the local electrical switch. Now let's add another ascender to the mega switch ring. The signal from node two travels through all the other nodes in the same way. And now at node three, the WSS is now received from all the other two nodes on the ring and the WS of node three can now select four wavelengths from a total of eight wavelengths on these two fibers. And then the wavelengths are demultiplexed into the transceivers on the local rack of node three. Now, okay, we can finish this three node example with mega switch by adding the sending component, components of node, two, node three. Uh, now each node can send on K wavelengths and these wavelengths can be received on any node on this multi-fiber ring. Uh, which enables a widespread all-to-all -all connect connectivity simultaneously. We have proven the rearrangeably non-blocking property of MegaSwitch in our paper. Uh, this three-node example has uh, 12 ports, and the key parameter of MegaSwitch scalability are uh, as follows. The port count of WSS is W, and in this case it's two. Uh, w actually determines the number of nodes on the ring N. Uh, each node can receive from W other nodes, so the maximum number of nodes on the ring is W plus one. Each fiber can carry K wavelengths, which means that each electrical switch can also send using K wavelengths. So uh, the total uh, port count omega switch is N times K. Uh, using existing technology, we projected that the port count can go up to uh, 6,000 ports, more than 6,000 ports. Uh, to better understand how mega switch works, uh, we now look at a unicast example. Uh, in this example, uh, host one tries to communicate with host 12. To do this, the control plane first select the blue wavelengths uh, uh, as the wavelengths for this multicast. We then connect the, uh, we then configure the WSS in node three to select the, select the blue wavelengths on the fiber from node one. Uh, in the meantime, we can set up the routing in both uh, packet switches, uh, and uh, we can see that uh, step two and three can be done in parallel. Uh, after this, the unicast from host one to host 12 is established. Uh, multicast on mega switches is very natural to do because every signal is broadcast to every node. Uh, in this multicast example, every receiving node can just select from the fiber and the wavelength that carries the multicast traffic, uh, which is the red wavelength on the fiber from node one. Uh, with this, we can establish a uh, multicast from host one uh, to host five, six, seven, and 10. Uh, so this is basically how the data plane on Megaswitch works. And the Megaswitch can be constructed uh, using commercially available components. And we have in fact implemented a prototype uh, OWS plus PRF box. And it can fit into uh, existing data center racks. Each box are designed to take, at, uh, uh, take 16 wavelengths and can be connected into a ring using the inter OWS ports. Uh, we use a Raspberry Pi in each box uh, as the controller. So uh, using five of this box, we uh, implement a prototype with 40 ports. Uh, we use two electrical 10G switches in, the, in this prototype, and we divide the physical electrical switch into five virtual uh, uh, packet switches using VLANs, so that we have in total five nodes, and each node is a OWS EPS pair, and we have eight wavelengths per node. There's some physical limitations. We ideally, we would want uh, mega switch to have a uh, high port count and low WSS switching speed. But in the process of implementing the prototype, we found that we cannot achieve both at the same time. And uh, the lowest uh, switching latency reported in the data center opti optical networking is Modia, which has demonstrated a uh, switching latency of microseconds using the DLP technology. Uh, however, in the implementation of our prototype, we find out that uh, WSS with DLP technology is not actually scalable. Uh, beyond eight ports, we cannot maintain the 11 microsecond switching delay. 
uh, megaswitch requires a larger WSS port count to, its, uh, to scale to more ports. And in this prototype, we choose to use the liquid crystal technology. Uh, and the measured switching latency of the prototype WSS is about uh, three milliseconds. We believe this is a hard limit. And uh, although the optical networking community are still working on it, uh, in the meantime, uh, this switching latency of milliseconds is, is still too long for the latency sensitive applications. Uh, so to handle this, we now describe a control plane mechanism uh, to mitigate the negative impact of this uh, switching latency. Uh, we'll mainly talk about base mesh. And like previous works, we assume a centralized controller uh, managing both the electrical switches and the optical ones. Uh, when the demand is stable, we have proven that a mega switch can provide full bisection bandwidth. But when the traffic matrix is changing quickly on the tens of millisecond scale, or when the traffic matrix is estimated incorrectly, in the worst case, two nodes with communication demands may be cut off uh, completely. Uh, to avoid these situations, we design base mesh, or which is a flexible overlay network on mega switch to provide consistent connectivity between all the nodes so that uh, low latency traffic will not suffer from the switching latency. Uh, the idea of a base mesh is actually simple. Uh, each node will dedicate B wavelengths uh, to construct overlay network on the fully connected uh, uh, fiber mesh of a mega switch. Uh, so of course, we will learn from the overlay networking uh, and DHT literature, and we choose to use the symphony topology uh, because of two reasons. First, the number of base mesh wavelengths per node B, or uh, using DHT literature, the routing table size, uh, we want it to be adjustable so that the data center operators uh, can adjust for different degrees of traffic volatility. And second, we want guaranteed average latency for, uh, for uh, packet delivery. Uh, let's go through a concrete example of how, uh, how uh, the base mesh on a six node ring works. Uh, when B equals to one, the base mesh is just a ring, and the packet on this uh, ring can take on average 2.5 hops to reach its destination. For example, a packet from node one will take four hops to reach uh, node three. And if we increase the uh, base mesh uh, capacity to three, then the average hop count will drop to 1.4, and now it takes two hops from node one to reach node three. And finally, if B is a five, the base mesh is basically a fully connected mesh network. And with every pair of network uh, connected using a direct wavelength. So setting B to W, and in this case five, will provide a uniform co cross rack latency uh, for the latency sensitive applications. Uh, finally, we will try to evaluate the mega switch prototype uh, with benchmarks and uh, uh, performance measurements from real application deployments on mega switch. The evaluation is done on the same 40 board test bed, and the uh, optical wavelength switches and the electrical su uh, uh, packet switches are controlled using out of band control network. And for all the test bed experiments, we assume the traffic, matrix, uh, traffic demand matrix are known beforehand. First, uh, we look at an all all communication pattern called the host level stride. In this pattern, every 10 seconds, one wavelength will change per rack. Uh, we can see that when the circuit is stable, a uh, mega switch can provide a full bisection bandwidth uh, for all the ports in this, uh, for all the hosts in this all to all communication pattern. And every 10 seconds, a uh, wavelength will change, causing a throughput drop of 50 gigabit per second. And we measure the duration of this drop, which is the reconfiguration latency of mega switch. And it is about uh, 20 milliseconds in total. And overall, we can say that mega switch can achieve full bisection bandwidth uh, when the circuit is stable. Uh, next, we will look at a real application deployments on mega switch. And first, a latency sensitive application, Redis, which is a in-memory object store. Uh, in this experiment, we will initiate one million get set requests from all the nodes uh, to a server in node one. Uh, we will vary the number of uh, base mesh wavelengths and measure the average uh, query completion time. When B equals to one, uh, the base mesh is a ring, and when B equals to four, the base mesh is a full mesh. 
Uh, for node one, the query will complete within the same rack, resulting in a really low uh, uh, query completion la latency. Uh, but for node two, when base mesh has only one wavelength, uh, the query from node two will traverse uh, four uh, other racks, uh, four other nodes before reaching its destination, resulting in a really long latency. But we can see that with more wavelengths in the base mesh, uh, the the latency can be reduced down to two, uh, which is basically come only from the local ra local tor switch and the destination tor switch. This is the same for all the other nodes. Uh, th th that's why uh, with a fully connected base mesh, we can achieve uh, uniform latency for all the cross-rack queries. We also deploy Spark 1.4 on our prototype and run a few parallel computing applications. Uh, in each experiment, we first connect the servers to a single Tor switch and run the applications and measure the per server pair uh, bandwidth demand. We then, we then connect the servers back to mega switch and aggregate the demands into uh, one second period demand matrices. Using these demand matrices, we can then configure the to the wavelength assignment algorithm on mega switch and assign the wavelengths. Uh, in fact, we find out that the demand of uh, Spark applications uh, tends to be quite stable in terms of uh, traffic volatility. And uh, during the application runtime, uh, less than 10 reconfigurations are required. Uh, we measured uh, the job completion time as an end-to-end -end, uh, demand as an end-to-end -end metric that shows how Megaswitch impacts the application performance. We can see that from the flow com uh, job completion time of different applications, uh, Megaswitch has really similar performance uh, compared to the optimal scenario where all the servers are located within the same rack. Uh, in summary, uh, Megaswitch reused the uh, wavelengths uh, spatially and provides full isolation bandwidth for all the ports. And secondly, we design base mesh to provide consistent connectivity for latency sensitive applications. Uh, finally, we build a 40-port prototype with uh, five nodes on the ring and deploy and run real applications on it. Uh, to sum up, Megaswitch is a optical design that supports widespread high bandwidth uh, traffic patterns in today's production data centers. Uh, for more on the photons, uh, delay measurements, power budgets, and uh, many more, please to refer to our paper for more details. And uh, finally, we would like to invite you to test your innovative ideas for NSDI 18 uh, in a new workshop, <laughs> APNET, the first Asia-Pacific workshop on networking. And the uh, deadline is three weeks away. Three weeks away. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to take any questions. Questions? Hi, I'm Anya Gobadi from Hi. MSR. This is a really cool work. I especially like that you actually built a oh, mega switch you. prototype. I wonder if the port count limitation that you mentioned around 6,000 ports, is that a hard limit or can we push that to more? Uh, yes, we are able to push it to more, but uh, that depends on the technology we use. Actually, uh, let me see. Yeah. And this page, right? So uh, actually, the port count of Megaswitch is uh, depends on uh, both two parameters, n and k, right? Uh, but this, uh, so we can uh, try to increase uh, increase n uh, to the scale of k. Uh, k. K is the number of wavelengths per fiber, and is usually in the hundreds. And n is the port count of the WSS, which is usually in the tens. Uh, we can use we can use the AWGR matrix to uh, uh, basically a K by K matrix uh, to do the same thing as the, uh, as the current receiving components, which is a combination of the WSS Right, but it feels demand. like 6,000 is kind of almost about it. I mean, uh, what, yeah. what, how do you envision it to scale to 100,000? It is possible to go to 100,000. Uh, in the uh, OWS that we implemented, we actually uh, can support the scaling from two dimensions. Right, right now, we only have one uh, array on one dimension. But if we can uh, enable a torus on two dimensions, then we can uh, have n squared times k uh, scalability. And using that scalability, we can uh, achieve uh, the poor count that you just mentioned. So yeah. you envision 100,000 uh, is yeah. conceivable. Yeah. It, it is possible, yeah. Thanks. But there's difficulties to do that. 
Hi, Robin Guinness from uh, UC San Diego. Uh, I really like this work, and I particularly like that you not only built this, but you actually ran real applications on it and measured uh, completion times comparable to traditional tours. Um, Particularly, though, have you looked at running multiple applications simultaneously and how that would uh, perhaps interact with something with, like, demand collection for the controller in particular? It's a kind of difficult I've seen in uh, previous papers to collect demand and distinguish between different applications running perhaps in the same rack or across multiple racks in the data center and how that would impact the controller. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a really actually a really important question. That is, how do we predict the traffic demand from parallel computing applications? And uh, we actually have some measurement de- uh, results, but we, we didn't show, we, we have it in the backup slides, actually. Uh, this, this is from our previous work in uh, Flow Profit in ICDCS 15. And uh, this actually, we implemented a flow prediction uh, framework that can predict the uh, uh, traffic demand in ahead of time. And this actually shows the lead time of, uh, of predicting a Spark application. Uh, we, we have found out that uh, this... Uh, uh, the lead time of predicting a spark traffic can be hundreds of milliseconds. And uh, actually, the lead time for uh, Hadoop traffic can be in the 10, 10, 10 seconds. So uh, with this lead time, we can actually uh, do very accurate uh, traffic prediction and uh, uh, assign the wavelengths before the traffic actually happens. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Uh, hi. Max Millet, UCSD. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great work. Thank I just you. had a question. Did you, you didn't talk about it in the talk. Uh, did you do any cost modeling comparing your system to an electrical network? Uh, in terms of? Component cost. Uh, yes, we have some, uh, we have some cost comparisons, uh, but it is not uh, an using a uh, uh, price, but, uh, but the uh, c- complexity of the structure. Uh, it is actually very difficult to estimate the uh, optical component because, uh, for, for example, the PRF in our, in our design, we can max produce it and uh, uh, push the cost down to the circuit boards, the, the cost of circuit boards. Uh, so we, here we just do a cost comparison based on the complexity of op- optical structures. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, electrical fabric, here, uh, the major, um, the major, compo- the major cost will be the transceivers, uh, with, because uh, in different layers of uh, I- the electrical uh, topology will have multiple layers, and between the layers we have m- many transceivers. And the cost comparison, uh, in terms of cost, we uh, will save a lot of cost in that aspect because only we only have one layer of uh, transceivers. Um, right, but your DWM transceivers are more expensive, maybe than the. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is actually another, another point that I didn't mention in the talk. Uh, we are using DWDM transceivers, and DWDM transceivers are usually used for the uh, for the metro area uh, connections. And uh, we choose that in our prototype be- not because uh, oh, we want that 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 reach. Uh, in uh, in data centers, we actually really want a uh, shorter reach uh, DWDM transceiver, but we cannot find it. And uh, we believe that uh, if we relax the uh, design requirements on the DWDM transceivers, we can also push uh, push this cost down, the transceiver cost down. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Li Chen. Thank you.